right, so here we are back again several weeks later to um, do part two of knowing where you are. Following this whole pack of land through the seasons to see how the um, sort of ebb and flow of plant growth and availability um, moves uh, through time. And uh, it's immediately apparent that we have a lot of very lush green growth plus um, quite a good showing of, the, of different flowers, um, all of which are edible. So we'll, we'll run through the flowers and, um, and, and most of the green stuff. So um, straight away we can see these dandelions and I always tell people on my wild food walks um, that these are not flowers. You may have been calling them flowers all your life, but actually what they are is assemblages of many small flowers called florets. Um, but these individual pieces here, I'll just get one on its own. That is in fact the flower. Um, so both dandelion and daisy are, are part of the daisy family and are characterized in this way. So the white ones around the edge of the daisy are ray florets. Um, they're not petals, they're really flowers. And then on the uh, in the middle there, these are called disc florets. You'd have to get a um, magnifying glass on them to see them properly. But anyway, this is something you can do um, with all of the uh, daisy family flowers. <laughs> if you don't lose them to the wind as I'm doing, um, you can just pluck them off and, and uh, scatter them over a salad or on top of the soup or something like that, it's, it's quite a fun way to use them. Um, and also, there's another very fun thing that you can do with a dandelion. Get rid of the head, and that's a straw. You possibly want to just run, run a tap over that for a moment and wash through this milky stuff, which is ever so slightly bitter. But um, then you can just chuck it like that. Um, stepping back just a little bit, there's something here which we missed last time. This is Mousia chickweed. It's all gone a bit leggy there, but down here you can see the leaves. So in between time, we probably missed the best time to use this one. But it's um, it's a kind of chickweed um, with a sort of soft hair on it, but very very pleasant. And the stems are nice and crunchy. Um, another one we didn't see last time. Um, we saw ribwort plantain. We didn't see greater plantain. And later in the year, we'll see the flower spikes of this, and, and then after that, the seed. Greater plantain is very similar to ribwort plantain, which we talked about. Um, Uh, this is a, a poisonous plant that we didn't we didn't cotton on to last time. I think it probably was visible but much smaller, but we missed it. Um, so that's called ragwort and it's something that you would um, probably get away with eating once or twice. Um, the thing that would get you is if you used it regularly, if you, if you ate it regularly, because it's got liver damaging um, alkaloids in it. Um, so, at any rate, you probably you probably wouldn't you probably wouldn't swallow that even if you put it in your mouth. It's, it's very unpleasant tasting and it smells quite unpleasant too. This is um, this is a kind of willow herb. Um, all the willow herbs are edible as uh, salads. They're not my favourites. They do, for some people, create a slight itching at the back of the throat. Um, but try them for yourself. See, see if they're your cup of tea. Um, and they can go through sort of a mixed salad. Um, there's another one we overlooked last time. Well, in fact, I don't think we overlooked it. I think it just would not have been visible. So this has an underground root system, of, um, otherwise known as rhizomes. 
Uh, it's called silverweed. So this would have been dormant with the, with the root system. Um, it's now just beginning to grow through, but it's actually the roots that we're most interested in. These leaves here have a texture like paper, uh, not something that I would um, recommend. But the roots have a taste like chestnuts and, and, uh, and parsnips. And in parts of the world where they're a lot easier to dig up, you see this soil is like rock just now. Um, but like in the Hebrides, it grows on sandy beaches, so people can just get in there and, and, and dig it up. And, and apparently in that part of the world, it has kept people alive in times when other crops have failed because um, whilst they're quite thin, on a good silverweed patch, you, you would get quite a lot of uh, bulk um, if you dug it all up. And, and with other, as with other root crops, that's gonna leave a lot of fragments in the ground. So you would, you would get lots of regrowth. There's no way you'd be able to dig it all out. So it'll just grow from the fragments and, and recolonize after you've harvested it. You can see that the clover is, um, is very big now. Tiny, tiny little clover leaves we saw last time. That's getting much more substantial. The woodwort plantain grown up nicely here. Got the speedwell. There's a little scrap of purple dead nettle here. Very, very scrappy actually. Where that grows in a more lush fashion, we would harvest that for salads and um, for decorative flowers, chocolate shaped decorative flower there. It's a much larger dead nettle, the, the white dead nettle. They're called dead nettle because it closely resembles nettle and it has the same sort of opposite leaf pattern, but dead simply because it doesn't have a sting. And not in the same family. So nettle's got its own family. The white dead nettle is in the mint family. Um, this is something that, uh, well, you can, you can pluck the flowers off and use them to decorate salads and even desserts. Very pretty. When I was a kid, we used to try and suck the, uh, the nectar out. I say try because, like so. Tiny bit of nectar there. I say try because you have to get there before the bees. Basically, um, I think I get the, got the biggest one before me. Um, the leaves and tops, you can um, use them as greens, use them to make a soup or as a vegetable. They taste a little bit like green pepper. Over here, we've got the slow or blackthorn blossom. When this blossom first emerged, it would have just been the stark contrast of the white blossom against the, the bare branches here. Um, and also stark contrast against the general picture on, of the landscape w without much colour. And now we've got lots of flowers and, and much more green growth emerging, so that contrast is kind of uh, fading out. Um, the nettle's now in full swing. Um, peak time to harvest now, we just cut them off like that. You can check out some of our other videos, we've got a few nettle recipes. Uh, it makes a lovely soup, good with eggs, good with mushrooms, and good just steamed and served with pretty much anything you like. Um, we've got cleavers here, coming through quite nicely. Makes a lovely spring tonic, um, and that will uh, flush out your lymph glands. What I would recommend doing with that is getting a nice handful, crushing it, putting it in a jug of water, and letting it infuse. Um, lovely flavours of green banana and pea coming out there. Um, wild chervil. Um, Nice leaf chopped through salads or um, used as a herb in place of chervil or parsley. Several uh, poisonous lookalikes to this one, so not something you should attempt to gather unless you're pretty well uh, 
first implant identification and, and know this and the lookalikes. And yeah, these stalks can be chopped and just put through a crunchy salad or use as a base vegetable um, for soups and casseroles and things as you would um, celery. And the stalks later on will get almost as big as celery. See our little sorrel patch here and here. Um, let's just concentrate on this one. So sorrel leaves now much, much bigger. Not as quite as uh, delicate as before. And um, the leaves at this stage have slightly more sort of irony flavour. But there's lots of juice in that stalk there. Um, there's a tendency to sort of to pick off stalks and throw them away, but that's definitely the most tasty bit. Oh. The dock is now getting more substantial. So nice handful of those dock stalks and these can be chopped and um, probably when they're slightly bigger than this um, but you could use that as a substitute for rhubarb like a rhubarb crumble, uh, dock crumble um, or just chop this through salads or fry it and you've got a slightly sour um, crunchy vegetable could be used in place of um, in the same way as croutons or something like that for, for um, sprinkling on the top of a soup Likewise, the hogweed is now getting um, quite substantial. Actually, I'm not sure we saw that at all last time. Um, there we have a hogweed leaf. Um, it's what's known as a compound leaf, you see. So these bits coming off the side here are leaflets. The whole thing there is referred to as a leaf. Um, the leaf blades are quite fibrous, but um, remember that's a good thing. In the West we eat far too little fibre, so um, we actually have a lack of um, fibrous plants. And um, the, um, the trick, if you don't want to just be chewing for hours then, is to, is to try and work around the fibre. And the uh, stalk is likewise very fibrous. You can see these ribs going up, that's, that's all pretty much fibre. If I break that in half, you'll see, you see all those fibres. And they're pretty tough and chewy, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to munch your way through that. But what we do, um, uh, in this case, is just chop it like you would celery or maybe slightly smaller. And then that's either going to be fried or um, put in uh, a salad. However, if you braise this for long enough, those fibres do eventually soften. And, and in which case you can use it whole. This we would fry until crispy or just chop it a lot and again put it through salads if we we're going to eat it raw. Um, I won't say too much about it now but that uh, stalk there chopped and lacto fermented is, is the source of the original borscht. We'll probably do a special video about that but borscht originally had nothing to do with beetroot or lemon juice. It was made from this plant, hogweed. Um, now somebody astutely pointed out in the comments um, that I wrongly called this wintergreen last time. It's not wintergreen at all. That's quite a different plant. This is winter cress or yellow rocket. It's quite closely related to American winter cress or land cress, which um, quite a lot of people grow and I think chefs make quite a lot of use of it. This is a little bit more Pokey, um, a bit of a bitter kick. Um, that's not everybody's cup of tea um, if you're challenged by bitterness, but then again, um, alongside fibre, um, bitterness is something we probably don't get enough of in our diet. A lot of these bitter compounds are actually very health giving. Um, but again, that's probably the subject of a whole video in itself. 
at this point we've got wintercress broccoli happening there. So the plants can be harvested uh, just for the tops or the leaves and tops or indeed for the, uh, the stems which would uh, once again chop down and go nicely through a, a crunchy um, wild salad or in combination with, with some cultivated stuff like beetroot and carrot. Um, we didn't comment on this last time but this is a, a beech tree and these young beech leaves can be harvested and put through salads at the moment. They don't have any really strongly distinctive flavours, just slightly tannic but uh, pleasant texture and um, one of the things that I think is worth considering with wild plants is just an opportunity to get a massive diversity of different plants into your diet and whilst we don't necessarily have nutrition profiles for all of them the idea that I work with is just each one is going to have something that the, the others don't potentially so if we eat all of them then that's lots of good things we're ingesting. Um, slightly beyond the boundaries of our piece of land here but it's so close uh, it seemed rude not to mention it this is a wild cherry up here that's just coming into blossom and it's part of the succession of blossoms in the spring. We, we have cherry plum just around the corner. Um, that's the first blossom to come. Then the, uh, the slow and also elsewhere there's damson that's just coming out um, behind the slow, but the, 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 then the wild cherry. Um, and that's a native species, although it's widely planted. Um, later in the year, the cherries um, will be around in, in July or so. Uh, quite a sour cherry, although some are sweeter than others. Um, the leaf tastes slightly almondy, so that's quite interesting. Um, if you catch it now while it's still tender, that, that again could go through salads. Oddly, the cherry uh, blossom in the UK doesn't taste at all of almond. Uh, and that almond flavour is, is quite characteristic of this tribe of plants, including the plums and the cherries, almond obviously, and apricot and peach. But for some reason, um, this is an exception. The flower, the flower does not taste about. And we can now see the dandelion much more um, substantial now. Nice big long leaves. And one of the things about this time of year, as you'll have noticed with most of these plants, because they're so much bigger, it's possible to pick quite a lot in not very much time at all. The real time of abundance and um, almost spoilt for choice. You, you, you could potentially do a salad with everything we've seen today, but uh, another approach is just to cook with the same ingredient every day while it's abundant. You know, you, there's lots of different ways you can go. At the moment, I'm doing a lot of cooking with nettles and um, just exploring the different uses, but um, partly because I have so many growing just, just outside my door at home. Uh, dandelions, though, are likely to be in the same category for, for many people. Um, so abundant and um, often grown very close to where you live. Now, I just want to draw attention to something here which we didn't mention last time. Uh, obviously, there was grass here, and we didn't talk about grass, but uh, Grass is something which globally we rely on very heavily in terms of food with our rice and wheat and oats and, and so on. Many and uh, maize of course. Um, but uh, there are many many different species of grass and other than a very few um, nearly all have um, edible seeds. Some are very tiny like the seeds of this one are very very tiny. Uh, but um, there's, uh, there's number one a lot of unrealized potential I think especially with the more fiddly seeds that these days we could apply technological uh, fixes to um, processing them which in the past people probably would have thought was just not worth bothering with um, 
but the other thing is there's lots of lost traditions or, or, or now dead traditions with using many more species than we currently do uh, and, and wild grass species being harvested uh, sometimes on a massive scale um, um, yeah there's a lot to be said about that but uh, basically there's no toxic grass species on this piece of land so um, if uh, the people that mow this hold off until um, after the seeds are formed we may be able to talk in more detail about exactly which grass species we have and uh, the viability of using their seeds. But even the, the leaf blades of the grass lend themselves to use. If you, if you have a wheat grass juicer or other you know, heavy duty juicer, um, any grass can be juiced. Uh, it's something I've been meaning to do for a long time. Um, um, and that's just to work through all the different grass species and make flavoured tasting notes and, uh, and, and make a comparison. Because I have a feeling there's some seriously delicious grass species out there just from that juicing perspective. We have one called sweet vernal grass. I don't think it's on this piece of land, but that has the uh, typical coumarin flavor you find in sweet woodruff and tonka beans, sort of almond and vanilla. And if, if you juice that, you get the, those flavors and also a lovely green grassy flavor alongside. You see the bramble just coming into leaf now. Um, before these leaves opened up, we could have picked off the shoots and eaten them. Um, but these leaves here could um, be harvested now and dried, slightly fermented and used as a kind of herbal tea. Uh, here we have the black medic just beginning to flower. As I said before, it's the seed we're most interested in, so we waiting for the uh, aftermath of the flowering. And then the elder is now almost fully in leaf um, and starting to present with elderflower buds. And I would say looking at these that we're going to have um, elderflower very early this year. It's often not out until the first or even second week of June on a very late year. I think we're going to have this um, early or mid-May. And one more plant that we missed last time. Um, and possibly was completely dormant last time. This is yarrow. Um, that's one of the larger leaves there and these more delicate leaves here. So this is um, a kind of mildly well, I'd say it is a herb, but not so strongly aromatic as, um, for example, some of the herbs in the mint family. But it, it tastes like some of those mint family herbs. It tastes a little bit like rosemary, um, and a little bit like sage, but also a little bit carroty. And I would tend to just strip the fronds off. There's little herby fronds, or you could just chop the whole thing down, but um, for a more delicate dish, if you're serving that with a piece of fish or something, you'd want these, these fronds stripped off. Later in the year, that's going to be um, a source of a, a very aromatic flower. And um, Yarrow was once used as a brewing plant, and um, I believe it was the flower that was used. But we'll talk more about that when we can actually see it. Alright, well, quite a dramatic change from last time to this. We'll come back here in a few more weeks and, um, and see, see how it's changed again.